Hi, everybody. Um, just giving uh, people a, a minute or so to join. Um, thanks for uh, attending uh, one of our webinars. I'll just give people a minute or two. It's uh, just the top of the hour right now, depending on where you are. So let me um, give another minute to for you to join and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Okay, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for joining. We'll uh, we'll get started there. But uh, yeah, I just want to you know welcome everybody into another John Crane webinar. My name is uh, Ken Sewolczyk. I'm a marketing communication specialist with uh, with John Crane, and I'll be your host for today's presentation. Um, if you joined us for session one or two, welcome back. Um, if you weren't able to join the first two sessions, they are available on demand on our website. Uh, just go to webinars under the resources tabs where you can download the recordings and view the webinar. Um, and this session will be available uh, as well. Uh, attendees will get it um, via email and it also be posted on the website as, uh, as well. So with that, um, I know most of you are probably familiar with us, but I wanted to um, give you a little background about John Crane for those of us who, for those of you who may not be. Um, we were founded over 100 years ago and are a global leader in rotating equipment solutions. We have an uh, outstanding reputation um, for uh, designing and engineering high quality, durable, customized solutions. Um, and uh, we, in 2019, we received Frost and Sullivan's Global Mechanical Steel Market Leadership Award and some of the industries we're in are oil and gas, uh, chemical mining, pulp and paper, water, wastewater, and um, in some of the, and you can see the last of the list uh, there. Um, so let me go with a, a bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, just if you want, we'll take questions at the end of the webinar uh, to submit questions or comments at any time, you should see a Q&A button at the uh, bottom portion of your screen. Um, and if you do have any technical issues, just refer to your Zoom uh, registration email. Um, the time today, we have about a 45 minute schedule for the live webinar and we'll answer as many questions as we can at the end. Um, for those that we, um, we don't uh, get to, uh, we will address them individually um, you know, via email. And like I mentioned, this will be posted on the John Crane website and you will get an email with the recording. And um, just to give you an idea of, of you know, what we talked about, outcome and scope of the series, um, you know, at the end of the series, which is today is the last session, you should be able to correctly interpret the signs of equipment issues, which may lead to seal damage or indicate impairment, impairment has occurred. Uh, you'll be able to adjust the operation of equipment to avoid seal damage and interpret the condition of damage or leaking seal components for yourself and identify possible causes. But just uh, keep in mind, full diagnosis and repairs should be carried out by qualified John Crane personnel. Um, this webinar covers our, uh, our simple seals installed in thousands of equipment, pieces of equipment around the world, um, including uh, single seals, rotating primary ring, and pusher and elastomer bellows uh, type seals. Um, and just to give you an outline of today's session, we'll be talking about interpreting the condition of the seal and we'll go over um, coning and negative rotation, thermal distortion, high wear or thermally distressed uh, surface and high wear and grooving. And we'll talk about some of the actions that'll help you um, ensure long seal life, such as heat removal, uh, external flush and, and so forth. And again, we will take a Q&A at the end. So I'd like to introduce uh, today's speakers. 
Um, we have Stuart Worthington, who is from our Manchester, England location. Um, he has seven years of experience in a product development role working on high duty ceiling and bespoke solutions. Um, his area of specialties include um, high duty applications, designing and developing bespoke solutions, calculations and troubleshooting. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Liverpool. Uh, industry experience, um, he is involved in oil and gas. He was a maintenance engineer for the railway industry and also a product engineer for a uh, pump OEM. And coming to us from um, in Pasadena, Texas location, we had, have Andrew Filipowski. He has uh, five years of experience with mechanical seals and uh, John Crane in various field-based roles. His responsibilities have included seal and support system troubleshooting, seal performance calculations, and seal failure analysis. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. In industry experience, he's been involved in oil and gas from both the pipeline, pipelines and refineries, and also in the petrochemical industry. And with that, I will turn it over to Andrew to begin uh, today's program. All right, thanks for that, Ken. Uh, look at today. Uh, the first one we're gonna look at is what we would consider uh, coning, also called negative rotation. And what we're looking at here, as you can see in the diagram at the bottom of the picture, we have the mating ring displayed on the left and the primary ring displayed on the right. We're seeing this heavier rotation, uh, most likely caused by pressure. That's causing higher contact at the OD of the faces. Uh, because of the narrow profile of the mating ring, you might see some edge chipping occurring at the OD of the primary ring as well, heavier wear at the OD. And then as we move towards the ID, seeing less and less and potentially even no contact, depending on the amount of distortion that we're seeing. On the mating ring, uh, we would only see this heavier contact at the OD of the wear pattern, not at the OD of the mating ring, but heavier at the OD of the wear pattern. Now, this can be caused by rotation due to pressure. Um, that pressure, when it's in an OD pressurized arrangement, is going to want to cause the primary ring to rotate and also distort inward, causing this to happen. The other thing that could happen though is that the faces themselves may not have been lapped correctly um, they may, may have been improperly lapped uh, with a higher surface at the OD that could cause this as well. Um, if it's a result of overpressurization, we'd want to make sure that one, the seal is rated for the pressure of that service. Um, if it's not, we might need to consider a change to the seal design, uh, potentially a change to the materials that we're using for the seal faces as well. Um, if it's a flatness issue, that should be checked um, and should be caught during the seal assembly process. And we'll talk about in a little bit in a minute how we make sure that the seal faces are flat. Looking at the inverse of this, now we're gonna talk about a scenario where we're seeing heavier contact to the ID. So this would be caused by thermal distortion or could be caused or called positive rotation. So now instead of having the faces narrower or closer together at the OD, we're seeing the faces come closer together at the ID. Um, so if you look at the primary ring, you would see that heavy wear uh, potential for chipping and, and cracking at the ID. And then as we move away towards the OD, seeing less extensive wear, potentially even nowhere depending on, nowhere, depending on the amount of distortion that we're seeing. Um, this can come from uh, two potential sources. We call it thermal distortion uh, because high uh, temperature gradients, high heat that's being generated at the seal faces can cause this. As materials get hot, as temperature increases, those materials want to grow um, and it's gonna want to grow outward at different rates based on the different temperatures that we're seeing throughout the seal faces. So as it grows out, it grows more at the location of the heat generation, which is towards the ID, and it causes those IDs to come together, causing the heavier wear there, um, causing the heavier, um, the damage at that part of the seal face. Now, again, like on the last slide, this also can be caused if the faces were not correctly la lapped, um, if they were not properly, uh, or if they were not adequately flat when they were installed. Um, so it's, it's imperative that we're making sure that we're doing a good job with not just the lapping process, but also checking to make sure that it was performed correctly. Um, if we've ruled out lapping as a cause and it is a result of uh, thermal distortion, then we want to check how well we are cooling the seal. Um, this is normally done through the use of a support system. There's a number of API flush plans um, that you may be familiar with that are used to both flush and cool and lubricate the seal faces. So we want to make sure that the support system we're using is uh, performing adequately and that it's able to handle the heat load for that seal to make sure it's keeping it properly cooled. Um, but 
as I mentioned, we need to make sure that we are lapping the faces flat. So let's take a look at how we do that. The uh, process that we're going to use is referred to as lapping, and we're going to use a lapping table, which can see, be seen on the left picture, to accomplish this. On top of that, uh, using this lapping machine, we have the actual lapping uh, table surface, which is the main larger circle in the middle. We have a set of three conditioning rings shown here, and then our seal faces will be placed within those conditioning rings. As the lapping table rotates and the conditioning ring rotates, it keeps the seal faces moving to make sure that the actual lapping procedure is being carried out at a nice even rate and will provide uh, weight or pressure to the back of the rings to make sure that we're getting the amount of lapping required. And again, that it's being carried out at a nice even rate. Um, usually oil or water-based mixtures will be used with the lapping table, um, oftentimes with an abrasive material when we're lapping carbon, uh, which is what we typically use for our primary rings um, to make sure that we get them sufficiently flat. Once that's been carried out, we actually need to make uh, or do some sort of a check to make sure that the lapping was carried out correctly. And we're gonna use that with the combination of a helium light source and an optical flat. Uh, now, most seal faces, when they just go through the lapping process, will not be reflective enough to adequately see the light bands that we're looking for. So um, more, more often than not, those seal faces will actually be polished in between the lapping table and the optical flat. But what we're going to do here is shine a helium light and uh, reflect that helium light off the seal face. So on the picture on the right side of this, uh, uh, of this slide, you can see an optical flat with a seal face underneath it and we can see those light bands on the seal face. Um, as the light is reflected and interferes with itself, um, it tells us how far out of flat we are. If those light bands are all nice and straight, um, it would be an indication that the seal face itself is flat. As we start to see more and more curvature, we, start, uh, we can start telling that we're getting farther and farther away from being flat. Depending on the location and the um, orientation of that curvature, we can tell whether we're out of flat in the uh, in one direction or the other, whether it's been more convex or a concave lap that's been applied to the face. Um, and if it doesn't meet spec, then it needs to go back through the lapping process. The uh, picture in the bottom left there shows a, uh, a, a label on our light source here with the light bands called out for 11.6 millionths of an inch. Um, that's actually one half of a light band of helium. Um, every half of a light band causes the interference. So if we're within one light band of flat, we would be within 11.6 millionths of an inch, which is about 0.3 microns of being flat. So assuming we've made sure everything is nice and flat, we've made sure that we're not seeing excessive uh, pressure or thermal distortions of the faces. Some of the other uh, wear patterns or failure mechanisms that we can see on seals are high wear and thermally distressed surfaces. And on the next three slides, we're going to talk about similar uh, failure mechanisms, but it might be different in uh, where we see it on the face, whether we see it all the way around or in, or in patches or only in one location. So the first one we're going to look at is if we see this high wear um, or thermally distressed surface all the way around the, uh, the full circumference of the face. The picture on the right here shows a mating ring uh, with a very uh, visible wear pattern where we can see that high amount of wear that's occurring. It's also possible that we might see heat checking occur, uh, which we'll see on some pictures on the next few slides. But um, if we're seeing this on the mating ring, a lot of times if we're using a carbon primary ring, we'll see heavy wear of the carbon primary ring, and we'll start to see some carbon deposits, some carbon dusting on the atmospheric side of the seal. Um, there's a potential if you're walking by a piece of equipment when this was occurring, you might hear the sounds of popping or flashing occurring within this uh, at the seal interface. What this is telling us is that the liquid, the fluid that's being used to lubricate the seal is vaporizing between the seal faces. Um, so it's going from a liquid to a gas. It's not able to provide enough lubrication for the seals anymore. We're starting to see heavier contact, higher heat generation, heavier wear occurring between the faces. Um, this can also occur if the seal faces themselves are overloaded. So if they were not um, installed at the proper working height, there's not enough flexibility of the, the spring mechanism behind the primary ring. And again, as a result of that, we're going to get heavy contact between the faces, high amounts of, of heat being generated, and, and heavy amounts of wear. So if we're seeing this occurring on the seal, uh, one, if it's a component seal, we want to make sure that we're following a good installation procedure to make sure that the seal is set properly, or uh, change that out to a cartridge seal where the working height of the seal is set by the seal manufacturer and it simplifies the installation procedure. 
Um, if it's if the seal uh, liquid vaporizing is more of a concern, we'd want to go through and review our support system. Similar to when we were making sure we had enough cooling to prevent the thermal distortion of the faces, we want to make sure we have enough cooling being provided to keep our sealed fluid in a liquid form to provide a good lubrication for the seal, making sure it's set up to provide enough flow rate to handle the heat load of the seal. The next thing we could look at is if instead of seeing this uh, heavy wear or this thermal uh, damage all the way around the seal faces, we might only see it on one portion of the seal face. And oftentimes it will be directly opposite or 180 degrees from the inlet of the seal flush where the flush is being introduced to the seal to the seal faces. Um, the picture on the right here shows an example of heat checking, which we mentioned on the last slide. So that's these radial cracks that will develop on the seal face. Um, most or most commonly found on tungsten carbide materials. Um, it is also a possibility on silicon carbide, but more often than not, it's going to be uh, associated with tungsten carbide. The uh, primary ring will likely have high wear all the way around. And again, potential for uh, carbon deposits on the atmospheric side of the seal, because again, we're talking about a rotating primary ring and a stationary mating ring. The symptoms that you might notice on the pump uh, are going to be very similar to what we talked about previously. Um, but instead of it being all the way around, we're now localizing it to this one point. So we're seeing potentially liquid everywhere else, uh, but vaporization occurring, that heavy contact occurring at that one location. Um, so that would tell us that there's a possibility that the seal flush is not being forced uh, around the faces well enough. We're not getting ev even or enough cooling all the way around the faces. Um, so we want to make sure that the seal flush system is performing adequately, but also look at either the seal gland or the seal chamber where the seal flush is being introduced and see if we can make a change to help better distribute or in, and make it a more even flow all the way around the seal instead of just a single flush point uh, coming in and only primarily cooling one side of the seal. The next thing that we're going to uh, consider is now we've looked at full 360, now we've looked at one location. Um, it's also possible that we might see it in patches. So we might see it in multiple locations around the, uh, around the face, uh, around the seal faces, primarily in multiple locations around the mating ring, and then heavy everywhere around the primary ring. And again, you'll see uh, pictures on the right here, again, showing examples of, of heat checking on the mating ring on the top, uh, where the heat checking is primarily contained within the wear track and then heat checking on the primary ring on the bottom where the heat checking reaches out to the edges of the face. Um, it's possible, or the symptoms that we would hear or see or experience around the pump are again, very similar to the uh, last uh, couple of slides. Um, and it's more likely to occur on those uh, more, volatile, more volatile, lighter specific gravity, higher vapor pressure fluids, where we're, not, we're operating with less margin between our sealed pressure and our fluids vapor pressure. So again, a sign that the fluid potentially is vaporizing. Uh, we might be overloading those seal faces. So making a lot of the same checks that we've been making previously, going through and doing a, a, a thorough analysis of the support system, making sure that it's set up um, and operated correctly to achieve the necessary flow rate for the seal design um, and is able to handle the heat load or the heat that's being generated by that seal. So. We've talked a lot on these last three um, slides about heat related damage. Uh, we talked about also thermal distortion of the seal. So it's important to know where that heat is being coming, where that heat is coming from, how it's being generated. And so to discuss that, I'm gonna turn things over to Stuart. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so yeah, maintaining that theme of the heat generation uh, and talking a little bit about the background of where it's coming from and, and how it impacts seal performance. Uh, so the main sources are coming directly from the seal faces themselves. And that is a combination of the friction from the contact between the seal faces, but then also uh, there'll be shearing effects, uh, viscous shear of the flush, uh, the fluid, which is inside the seal chamber and between the seal faces. And if we zoom right in on the seal faces, there are sort of three modes that seals will run in. Uh, we've got those three images there on the screen. And the image on the left shows what is in the seal world known as a boundary condition. That would be a seal which is running with no fluid film whatsoever. There is uh, just pure contact between the seal faces. This would be like a, a dry running situation. In here, 100% of our heat, we would consider that to be from frictional forces. 
Uh, and again, there's no lubrication here, so we would expect that heat to be very high and the seal to wear out very quickly. And that would definitely most likely lead to the, uh, the damage that you've seen on the last few slides. Um, very few seals are designed to run in this condition. However, the image on the right there shows what it's known as a purely hydrodynamic running profile. And that is where you have zero contact between the seal faces and a very thick fluid film. In that case, the, again, there's no contact. So in theory, there is zero frictional heat and all of the heat is by viscous shear. Normally in these situations, the total heat is quite low because again, we don't have that contact. Um, the interesting thing with viscous shear is the way that as, um, as the hydrodynamic forces get higher, uh, they ramp up significantly. It's more of a square relationship. Whereas the vast majority of seals, again, they don't run like this because if they were running in purely hydrodynamic, uh, the leakage would be enormous. Most seals run in that profile that you can see there in the middle, which is a mixed running condition where we have points of contact well, um, on the very peaks of the materials of the primary ring and the mating ring where they're touching each other. But you can also see there's lots of gaps in between the primary ring and mating ring and that area is filled with fluid. So we have a combined effect. We have some friction and we have some viscous shear and generally, uh, this is again, this is very common uh, and gives us good life from that uh, fluid film. Uh, but it also means that we have to consider the heat from both sources and mechanical seal suppliers when they're designing seals, when they're uh, checking them to make sure they're suitable for your application. We need to run our calculations to understand how much heat is being generated because that heat needs to be removed. So we flick to the next slide. You can see a regular mechanical seal running there. And then once it starts to run, we can see that we're gonna get heat directly at the, uh, the point of contact between the primary ring and the mating ring. And that is one of the reasons why we potentially see uh, one of the damage patterns that again, we saw on one of the earlier slides, the fronts of the primary ring and mating ring are gonna get hot. They're gonna expand, which is gonna cause them to kind of cone outwards, which means that the very, in a diameter of that contact point. Uh, if, the, if the thermal expansion is too great, you might get a very heavy contact in that area. So we, need, we wanna remove this heat and we wanna remove it because uh, otherwise temperatures will continue to rise and rise until we either hit the thermal limits of the materials, which again would cause that heat cracking damage that you've seen on the previous slides. Or we could also see uh, issues where we hit uh, some kind of phase change in the liquid. So it gets so hot, it vaporizes, and then again, we're running dry. So there's a few ways to keep that cool. What we're seeing here is a very simple method, which is to actually design the seal chamber itself. Uh, this kind of tapered design, when everything starts to run, just the natural churning and centrifugal forces will bring in fresh, cooler fluid and it will sweep away the hotter fluid from directly around the seal faces. This isn't incredibly efficient, but it will be perfectly suitable for pumps which are running at lower pressures, lower speeds, where there isn't a lot of heat to remove. However, most pumps will go for something closer to what we're seeing here, where we have um, the chamber blocked away and we have that entrance, that inlet port just above the mechanical seal. And this is the flush, which Andrew was referring to in his previous slides. And all that we do is a fluid, a cool fluid will be injected and it will pass over the mechanical seal and just provide a constant flow. So if we look at how, you know, where does this flush flow come from? Um, the simplest plan that we see on the next slide is just a recirculation line. So we take a line from the discharge of the pump and put it either you know, uh, somewhere around the seal chamber. And just the natural uh, difference in pressure from where we have the high pressure at the discharge and the low pressure in the seal chamber will cause a nice healthy flow over the mechanical seal. Now this flow needs to be, uh, needs to be enough flow to remove that heat. Um, but of course we don't want too much flow. We don't want excessive flow partly so we don't have an excessive flow directly over the seal, but also um, all the fluid which is being recirculated 
isn't being pushed further down the line. So it's inefficient to pump an unnecessary amount of fluid through. The way this is normally controlled is there might be, there might simply be a simple pipe. Um, however, often there'll be an orifice plate somewhere in that pipe as well. And that orifice will be sized to ensure there's a correct flow. To do this, seal vendors normally work with OEMs. Uh, we calculate the amount of heat to be removed and we'll calculate the flow which we need. Uh, once we've calculated the flow that we need, we then rely on the pump OEM to size the orifice correctly. So the, another uh, plan that we have is referred to as a line to suction. And the way that we do this is instead of having the line go to discharge, uh, it simply goes again to the suction line instead. The idea with this one is that the suction is usually at a lower pressure than the seal chamber. So instead of um, being a line uh, which pushes fluid in, this time it sucks fluid out. The reason we might often use this, uh, this is very popular on vertical pumps. The reason being that if there is any air in the pump, the highest point on that vertical pump is usually the seal chamber. And as we've discussed many times, we want to keep gas out of the seal chamber. And this, uh, this line to suction, while it's running, will actually suck out that fluid and just remove it from the seal chamber. So it's kind of an automatic venting line. There are a few disadvantages. The way it, one of the big ones is that it's, uh, there's usually not as much of a differential in pressure between the chamber and the suction compared with the chamber and the discharge. That means that it's not as easy to get a good flow rate through a plan 13. So if you have, uh, often the seal chamber is very close to suction pressure. Another disadvantage is that if the fluid which is coming into the seal chamber from say uh, a line to discharge, if that fluid is too hot, we can actually cool that down by adding a cooler, adding some kind of heat exchanger to directly remove the heat from there before it even comes into the seal chamber. Whereas you can't do that with a line to suction uh, because it's taking it directly from the process. So whatever the temperature is in the pump, that's the same temperature that's going to be flowing over the seal. So again, this is another, another kind of damage you might see when you've taken your seal apart, you might see this grooving or really high wear. And this would have probably been accompanied again by a, a short seal life. And um, you'll quite quickly see, or at least quicker than you should, you'll see a steady leak. And that leak is likely to continue when the shaft is stationary, as well as when it's rotating. You'll probably see these grooves. Uh, we often call them uh, gramophone grooves. Though that term is becoming less popular as people don't know what a gramophone is anymore. Uh, but you may see these grooves on the primary ring and the mating ring, particularly if they're both composed of a harder material like a silicon carbide or a tungsten carbide. However, if the use of the primary ring is a carbon material, a soft material, what you'll normally see is the primary ring looks fine, but the mating ring has this groove profile. And if you look at the primary ring through a microscope, you'll find that the surface of the primary ring um, has been covered, uh, is dotted with abrasive particles that probably weren't visible to the naked eye. So what we're seeing here is it's some kind of abrasive wear. And this could be, uh, if it was two hard faces, this could be from poor lubrication. What's happened is the faces have rubbed hard against each other and small particles are broken away from those faces and that's kind of created an abrasive powder directly between the faces. However, if it's a carbon ring against a hard ring, then you can be pretty confident that these are abrasive particles that were in the process fluid. They've made their way between the seal faces, got stuck in the carbon ring, and then the carbon ring has scored the hard ring as it's run against it. So if we're suspicious that it is uh, because of poor lubrication, then similar to what we would do with the uh, thermal damage, we would be looking to make sure that we had uh, good lapping on the faces. We'd wanna make sure that the closing forces were good by making sure the seal was set to the correct location. We'd wanna make sure we had sufficient cooling. But again, assessing the rate of flush flow across the seal, making sure if we have a cooler to cool things down, making sure that's operating correctly as well. However, if we're suspicious that this is being caused by particles, abrasive particles in the process fluid itself, then we would want to again understand where those are coming from. 
it might be that those abrasive particles were supposed to be removed by a, a suction strainer somewhere in the pump loop itself, um, or they maybe something that we have to remove directly before we inject fluid through the flush into the seal chamber. So we're going to show you one of the methods. There are several methods to try and control the amount of abrasives, um, but this is a pretty classic one in the mechanical seal world. This is referred to as a cyclone separator. What we do here is you can see elements of the other flush plans. We have a line which comes from the discharge of the pump. And then before it gets injected into the seal, it goes into this device, this cyclone separator, uh, which a bit like the inside of a modern vacuum cleaner, um, creates a cyclone inside, which forces the solids to go through the outlet at the bottom. However, clean fluid is able to make its way, uh, escape the cyclone and come out the line at the top. So the dirtier fluid comes out the bottom and that is simply fed down to the suction of the pump, whereas the cleaner fluid from the top is injected into the seal. There are a few limits to these. We need to make sure there's a good enough pressure differential uh, across the cyclone separator to generate a good cyclone. Uh, if the flow or the pressure differential is not high enough, uh, then we don't get a good enough effect and you'll see dirty fluid coming out of the, uh, well, out of the clean line as well. The other limitation is that we need the particles to be sufficiently dense. We want them to be heavier than the fluid that they're trapped in. So this isn't gonna work as well if it's uh, something like wood particles from some kind of wood pulp. They're likely to, you still like to see a high amount of abrasives in the fluid being injected into the seal. I believe we have another picture showing uh, a typical real life example of this, including the cutouts there so you can see that tapered shape inside, uh, and that's enough to create the cyclone effects. You can also see that these are generally quite thick, quite robust. Depending what particles are in there, we can find that they will slowly wear away the inside of the cyclone separator. So these are designed that you can install them, you know, fit and forget, walk away, and be confident it's going to last several years. Uh, but if you do start to see uh, a seal which has been running for a long time, there's never been abrasives, it's never been a problem before, and suddenly we're starting to see the short life and signs of abrasives. It is worth checking the cyclone separator, making sure that it's not worn away too much, making sure there's nothing clogging that um, so that we're not generating a good cyclone effect either. Another solution, again, we, we can't always use a cyclone separator. So another way that we can get around abrasives in the process fluid itself is that we can bring in an external flush. So this means instead of taking the process fluid, which has abrasives in it and injecting it into the seal, we get a, a source of a fluid from somewhere else. And this is typically uh, from somewhere further down the process line. So this pump may be running on the dirty product. We may have another pump further down the process line, which has been refined, it's been filtered, and that's full of clean fluid. And we may take a line off that discharge, for example, and then pipe that into this pump. Uh, again, that can be very favorable because it can completely eliminate any issues that we had with the fluid in this pump. However, it's often considered an expensive solution. We can be losing a few liters a minute or gallons a minute of our nicely refined products from further down the line. Um, and again, we're losing that by pumping it down into this pump. So it's not, again, not always a favorable solution. And the final thing I wanted to mention, and this is a uh, really, it's a big topic all on its own. It's something that uh, I just wanted to raise awareness of here, but it's the kind of thing we would cover in a separate webinar topic is when we can't use something like a, uh, an external flush, then it's uh, impossible to remove all the abrasives. Or there might be another reason that we simply do not want to use the process fluid as the lubricant for our seal faces. What may, we may be forced to do is actually apply a dual seal. Uh, this is where we have, uh, you can see on the zoom in there, we have the seal on the left, which is running on the process fluid. And then a little further down the shaft, we have a second mechanical seal. And then in between those two mechanical seals, we've filled that area with a second fluid. And uh, this is a pressurized system. So we have uh, fluid between the two, which is defined as a barrier fluid. And that is pressurized to a pressure which is higher than the pressure in the seal chamber. What that means is that that inboard seal 
is not even going to run using the process fluid as its lubricant. It's going to run with the barrier fluid as its lubricant. And again, it just means that we can almost eliminate a lot of the issues that we would have because of abrasives or poor viscosity profiles uh, if we try to use the process fluid as the lubricant. However, it then replaces it with another problem, which is the complexity and expense of running that system. Uh, but they're becoming increasingly popular in a world which is considering uh, long-term reliability and also uh, concern about dangerous process fluids leaking out to atmosphere. Uh, so again, if you have systems like this, uh, keep your eyes out for all the webinars covering these topics. And that is the end of our material for today. So I'll hand back over to Ken. Thanks, uh, Stuart, and thanks, uh, Andrew. So I just want to uh, mention this slide here. All the material that we presented over these three sessions are available um, through a brochure that we have on, on the John Crane website. Uh, it's called Cause and Correct corrective procedures for steel leakage. So it's a pretty handy, um, concise guide that you can use and you can download that from our website under the resources section under brochures. It also is available in, in a printed poster format. So if you'd like to um, use that in your, your location or facility, um, contact your uh, John Crane representative and they can help you um, get, your, your, uh, get one of those to you. Um, so then we will move over to the um, Q and A. Um, again, just to reiterate, uh, if you have any, any questions, um, please click the Q and A button on the bottom portion of your screen to um, to submit those questions. Um, I do have a uh, a few that have come in, so why don't we um, address those? Um, Stuart, I think um, this kind of is follows um, your presentation. Um, what kind of um, flow rate do we normally need in a flush line? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, so I have to start with the normal boring caveat by saying it depends um, because obviously each seal may generate a different amount of heat. Uh, so it will always be relative to that. Seals which are running at higher pressures and higher shaft speeds um, will have more heat to remove. But as a pretty consistent rule of thumb, uh, you might uh, typically expect to see about one gallon per minute for every inch of shaft size. Um, unfortunately, that rule of thumb doesn't translate quite as well into metric. It comes out of being about two liters a minute for every 10 mils of shaft size. And that's, those are just very typical values. Okay, um, thank you, Stuart. Um, Andrew, um, if you can address uh, this one, uh, what is the acceptable flatness criteria for seal faces? Sure. So we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier in my slides that we look for faces that are flat and ideally they're perfectly flat, but we know that that's not going to happen every time and it can put undue stress on that part of the, the repair or manufacturing process. Um, so for the majority of, of seals and especially on the smaller sizes, plus or two or plus or minus two light bands. So within two light bands of flat is considered acceptable. And when we're looking at the light bands there again, just to kind of reiterate and try to provide a little more clarity that light is only using uh, helium wavelengths. So we know the specific wavelength of that light band. Um, and looking at the pattern tells us how much or how often we are interfering with that light band, which tells us uh, based off of the known length of the light band, just how far out of flat we are. Okay, um, thanks, Andrew. Um, Stuart, another one um, for your direction. Um, how much abrasives in the fluid can a seal handle before we need special features? Yeah, absolutely. So I would start by saying the, you know, you'll always be told and the preference is always to remove as much abrasives as you can, because any abrasives which are present um, are potentially going to have an impact on seal life. Uh, but um, a typical seal we might, uh, we, they'll all come with their own published limits for how much abrasives they can handle. Um, and it's also com made complex by the fact that there is no one standard way to measure abrasives. Uh, but a typical value I hold in my head is about 0.3% uh, by weight. So if you have less than that, you're probably okay with a standard seal with carbon faces. If you go above that, you start to put in things, features like hard faces and you're being careful about you're checking your flushing plan, uh, trying to separate those away. If you go in significantly above that, then you start to really need uh, specialized slurry seals, which are designed specifically to run on these high abrasive duties. 
Okay, great. Um, thank you, Stuart. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of questions here. We'll try to get as uh, to as many of, as we can. We have about um, you know five minutes or so, and we can run it uh, you know a few minutes longer uh, to address the questions. Um, but uh, Andrew, I'll um, send this one over to you. Um, what is a light band, and how can uh, can you read it? Yeah, so that uh, that ties into the one earlier, and um, I'll try to explain it, even though visuals work best, and I'm only going to be able to work with words here. But so a a light source travels in a a wavelength that's reciprocating, kind of like a sinusoidal wave, if you're familiar with that. So a light band would be one period within that wave for helium light, and so it's a very specific amount, or it's a very specific length that is unique to the helium uh, light band, the wavelength of that light band. Um, and then when it reflects off the surface, depending on how far out of flat we are, every half length that we're out of flat, that light band will either reinforce itself and be bright, or it'll interfere itself and be dark. And it creates those bands, those light, that pattern that we see on the seal faces. So based on how, we, how that pattern looks, how many interferences we have there, um, we know how, whether or not we're flat, or if we're out of flat, how far out of flat we are. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, Stuart, um, another one here uh, I think uh, would fit, be fitting for you. Um, in a plan 53A, what are the chances of the seal catastrophically failing and draining the barrier fluid into the process in a very short time? Is there any concern with the seals running on nitrogen only and no barrier fluid for a short time? Sure, absolutely. So uh, for those that aren't in the um, oil and gas industry, the oil and gas industry refers to all these different flush plans with numbers. So a 53A uh, is one type of dual pressurized seal, uh, like I showed on that final slide, where we have the, the barrier fluid pressurized higher than the process fluid. And it is correct that the barrier fluid is leaking into the pump. So if the inboard seal were to catastrophically fail, yeah, you would very quickly see the barrier fluid um, pumping into the process. The question then is uh, the risk and what we do to mitigate it. So the risk is actually fairly low in most cases. Uh, the inboard seal is running at a smaller pressure differential than the outboard. So we typically find that the outboard is the seal most likely to wear out first um, or, or have some kind of difficulty. Uh, so we're less likely to see it pump directly in. Also seals tend not to fail catastrophically very quickly. So I would say the risk of it happening is relatively low, but then the other way that we mitigate it is that systems like this be more complex will also have instrumentation attached to them and those will be uh, wired up to alarms within the plant. So we want to make sure we detect that as early as possible and make sure that people are trained. It could be attached directly to an equipment trip to immediately shut the equipment down. Uh, or again, we would have want operators to respond as quickly as possible and shut down the equipment so that that doesn't happen. Okay, um, thank you, Stuart. Looks like we have, still have um, time for a few more. I see quite a few questions coming in. And just one thing to mention, I see some of you putting it in through the through the chat. If you could, because I don't think we'll be able to get to all, all these in the next few minutes. So if you could um, maybe recopy those over and, and use the, the Q&A feature in, in the center, um, that'll make it a little more a little easier for us to contact you uh, post webinar to to address some of these questions. A little hard to track actually who they came from and, and how to to reach out via the chat. So if you have a, a minute here, if you could do that, we'll we'll get your questions um, post uh, webinar. Um, Andrew, I'm going to um, ask uh, this one of you. Um, can you run a plan 53B with no cooler and heat soak is low? Right, so um, Stuart in his slides and on the previous tech section talked about a 53A. Uh, the difference between a 53A and a 53B is now instead of directly introducing the nitrogen to the barrier fluid to provide the pressure, we're now gonna fill up a bladder and use a bladder accumulator to provide pressure to the barrier fluid. So it's not directly interacting, the nitrogen or pressurizing gas is not directly interacting with the barrier fluid and it's not a constant supply either. It's gonna be a bladder that's pre-filled and then holds the pressure on the system. Um, now, as far as running it without a cooler, um, if the heat soak is low, uh, so it's important to keep in mind that there's gonna be two potential sources of heat for the barrier fluid. One's gonna be the heat soak that was mentioned in the question, um, but there's also gonna be heat being generated by the inner and outer seal faces that's gonna be transferred to the barrier fluid as well. So that would need to be evaluated uh, to determine what the, uh, the heat load on the barrier fluid would be. 
The other thing is with a 53B, we're no longer using a reservoir like we are for the, with the 53A. So there's no uh, cooling coils that are gonna be available there. So if it, no cooler heat exchanger, whether it be air-cooled or liquid-cooled exchanger is used with the 53B, the only way to dissipate heat from the barrier fluid is gonna be through the tubing or piping lines um, that are used to connect the inlet and outlet of the seal gland. Um, so on very, very low heat duty applications, it might be possible, um, but it's always recommended to use it um, when available to make sure that we're keeping the barrier fluid at an acceptable temperature so it has good lubrication properties. And so we don't start to see any degradation or breaking down of that barrier fluid. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, Stuart, um, this one um, is for you. Is it necessary to size orifices for the tubing system on a plan 31 slash 41, or is it managed within the separator? Sure, I can only speak for John Crane with this, um, but we certainly have internal calculation tools which allow us to, uh, from the data that the pump supplier gives us about chamber pressures and discharge pressures and the properties of the fluid, we can calculate uh, the performance of the cyclone without any orifices. And then uh, also we can put orifices in and recalculate. So sometimes the separator can just go straight in and, and it's fine, uh, but in other instances, we'll recommend orifices. But it's, again, it's purely a case by case basis. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Um, yeah, we're about out of time, but I'm gonna um, you know, keep going here. We've got so many questions coming in that I'd like to try to address as many as I can. So we'll extend for, for a few minutes here and appreciate all of your questions and all of your attendance to this uh, presentation. And you know, do, do keep in mind, we will have a recording uh, available at the, after the webinar. Um, so um, Andrew, if you can handle this one, when are uh, dry gas seals recommended and do dry gas seals have any advantages over pressurized dual seals? All right, so uh, dry gas seals, especially when we're talking, uh, focusing here on, on gas seals for pumps, it's gonna operate in a similar manner to the, dual, the wet dual pressurized version. So things like a plant 53 or 54, um, but instead of having a liquid barrier fluid, we now have a gaseous barrier fluid. It's usually gonna be nitrogen or some other inert gas. Um, so the, uh, the performance or the, the idea is the same that we don't want to have any process leakage to atmosphere. We only want some barrier leakage into the process and out the atmosphere. Um, so for applications where liquid dilution of the process is not acceptable for any barrier fluids, a gas seal will be a good fit. Um, any of the other applications where a dual pressurized seal, a gas seal will be a good fit. Uh, the other thing is because gas seals are non-contacting, um, there's less heat being generated at the seals and the, uh, there's less torque or drag between the faces. So uh, you're having less of a impact on the load on the motor from a, a dry gas seal compared to a wet contacting seal. And um, no barrier fluid again, uh, no liquid barrier fluid is needed. So as long as you have a, a good constant source of nitrogen or some other gas pressure available, it simplifies the operating procedures for the barrier system. It's more, if it's a constant seal chamber pressure, you set your nitrogen pressure, make sure it's turned on before you uh, introduce process to the pump and you're more or less good to go at that point. Okay, um, thanks, Andrew. I'm gonna, um, yeah, we'll, we'll take uh, one more here. Um, <laughs> this one also I think is, uh, looks like be uh, applicable to you, Andrew, is uh, plan 11 slash 61, a good seal flush plan for sour crude oils. Um, so crude oil, uh, we'll just start with crude oil, can be sealed effectively with a single seal. Uh, a plan 1161 would indicate that on the flush side, we have the plan 11 that Stuart talked about, which is recirculation from discharge to flush the seal. Um, the 61 isn't really much of a flush plan. All it actually designates is that there are uh, quench or quench and drain connections in the seal gland, but they're not currently being used for anything. Um, and because we're specifying sour crude oil, sour would indicate that H2S um, is present within the crude oil. So it would depend on just how sour or what that level of H2S is, whether or not a single seal would be acceptable because with a single seal, you are gonna have um, any leakage being directed to the atmospheric side of the seal. And since a plan 61 is indicated, there's no drain or leakage collection being used. So it's possible that the uh, leakage from the seal will be collecting there locally at the pump, uh, which can become a, a health hazard or an environmental concern depending on just how soured that crude oil is. 
Okay, great. Um, thanks, Andrew. So, um, you know, with that, I think we'll close off the, the presentation for today. We're just about out of time here, but uh, appreciate everybody uh, staying and submitted uh, so many questions. Um, you know, this is the last webinar in this series, but uh, John Crane is hosting them uh, rather frequently. So, um, you know, keep an eye on our LinkedIn social media accounts, um, your email accounts, uh, inbox as well as we mail it out and we do post them to our website. So keep an eye for upcoming webinars and we will be um, you know, happy um, to, uh, to give you as much education and information as we can. Again, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us today. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, interacting with you again. Again, thank you um, for your time.